how can we celebrate in a sustainable way? How can we feel connected with nature? How can we spark a sense of wonder? Inspired by nature, we bring organic lights into the city. Inovativni koncept da umjesto klasičnog vatrometa koji je veoma štetan za životnu sredinu, u specijalnim prilikama koristimo organski vatromet nazvan iskra u kojem svaka od ovih iskričevih kuglica padom na tlo donosi sjeme cvijeće u zemljište, samo je jedan u nizu spektakularno lijepih projekata holandskog umjetnika Dana Rosengardea koji svojim radom spaja inovacije, moderne tehnologije i ekologiju i to na javnim urbanim prostorima kao na svojevrsnoj sceni. Projekat Spark, koji nudi inovativno rešenje kako da zajednica slavi na održiv način ne ugrožavajući prirodu, doveo je Dana Rosengardea na cenogorsku konferenciju istog imena Spark, gdje je pred oduševljenom publikom govorio o drugim svojim projektima i inovativnim vizijama. Tako smo mogli da vidimo kako virtualnom poplavom umjetnik iskustveno suočava publiku sa realnošću klimatskih promjena. Zatim, kako je spojio slikarstvo Van Gogha i biciklističku stazu u gradu u kome je slavni slikar proveo dio svog života, prenoseći atmosferu slike Zvijezda na noć na asfalt. Ovi su mu projekti donijeli sjajnu reputaciju u Holandiji, pa je upravo njemu povjeren zadatak osvjetljavanja čuvenih holandskih brana koje zemlju štite od mora, koje su svojevrsni istorijski spomenik i na kojima dosad nisu bile dozvoljene nikakve pa ni umjetničke intervencije. Dan Rosengarde veoma je poznat i van granica svoje zemlje, posebno po projektu usisivača za smog koji prečišćava zagađeni vazduh u parkovima mnogih svjetskih metropola. Ovaj futuristički toranj usisava čestice smoga i omogućava građanima modernog megalopolisa da barem u zelenim gradskim zonama mogu da dišu čisti vazduh. a right for clean air, eh, to breathe, to feel free, to enjoy life, but we also have a role in clean air, right? And so one, one day I got inspired by Beijing smog, you know, like, and I was wondering, can we not just sort of capture that? And can we not clean it? And can we not make clean air parks, like an oasis in a desert? Can we not just do that in a city? And so that sparked the idea to build the Smog Free Tower, the largest smog vacuum cleaner, which sucks up polluted air, and makes these clean air parks where people can enjoy. And we did that in China, um, uh, India, Mexico, the Netherlands, Poland. Uh, really beautiful way of combining technology and design for, for something good. Yeah. What is interesting is that, you know, somehow the city is becoming a machine that is harming us okay, with its pollution and things. So let's build machines that can help us, right? And sort of that kind of design thinking is, I think, really inspiring. And that's the reason why I'm building these things. In the process of creating a smog-free tower, some new ideas spark from this uh, concept. How did you actually come up with the idea of a smog-free ring? Well, I think, you know, good ideas inspire, but great ideas activate, right? They activate more. Um, so one day, as we were producing these clean air towers, we had these buckets of smog particles uh, in our studio. And it's really disgusting stuff. Right? It's like this, ha, ah, it's like, ha, ah, it's like, you, in, you inhale 17 cigarettes per day uh, uh, when you live in a smoggy Beijing without the pressure of the nicotine, right? So it's like, but we were like, we should do something with this. Eh? Waste should not exist. Right? Like nature doesn't understand waste. And so we put it under a little microscope. 42%, 48% is carbon. Carbon under high pressure, you get diamonds. And so we started to make smog-free jewelry, smog-free rings from that pollution. And so by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air um, to the city. And so we had suddenly thousands of wedding couples, anniversary, um, engagements, people purchasing the ring to get married. 
And so the funding that we made with the jury helped us to build more smoke-free towers. So the waste was actually the activator, the enabler. And I think, you know, that kind of design thinking where it's about technology and function, but also about beauty and sharing and stories, that's when you create really impact. Yeah. Speaking of impactful stories, uh, let's say that the uh, smoke-free tower was not only recognized by humans, it was also appreciated by animals. Uh, could you share this interesting story with us? Yeah, we had one, one uh, story in Krakow in Poland, where suddenly as the opening was there with the clean air tower, little dogs started to pop up, so many of them. And we realized, of course, they can smell so much better. Eh? Uh, dogs can smell way better than us human beings. And so they were suffering from the smog. And so as the tower was up and running, they would smell the clean air from far, far away, started to abandon their owners and hang out around the tower. And, and they all looked so happy. And, and it was so interesting because we had the scientific report and the measurements and the scientists. But the, the fact that the dogs were there and, and would feel at home was also a sort of proof uh, of the functioning and uh, yeah it just shows that nature has a very good instinct of to sense what is good for them or not and why as human beings we've lost that a little bit that sensitivity that touch and maybe we, we got to bring that back yeah. is this why you create uh, projects like uh, flooding public spaces where people uh, can experientially face uh, climate changing reality we live in a world which is changing right whether we like it or not climate change, and we all know it, but it's a number thing, right? Um, 2.5 meter rising sea level, uh, degrees, uh, carbon neutral, it's, it's very numbery. And I think, you know, people don't change because of numbers, but they do change because of experiences. And so Waterlicht is a sort of flood, a virtual flood made of water to show how high the water level would be in the future. Really interesting way of showing people how our future world will look like the fact that it's not happened yet and the role we can take to, to prevent disasters. And so that's been traveling through the world. Um, and, and yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's thousands of people show up. On one hand, it's a bit scary, but it's also beautiful. Yeah, I, I love that combination. Apart from environment-related topics, uh, you uh, bring the spirit of art to public spaces. Uh, how did you possibly manage to connect uh, Van Gogh's art and uh, a cycling path? As a boy, I never stayed inside. I always went outside, you know, as a child, playing. I don't like inside. Inside is boring. And so, as an artist, as a designer, I'm so fascinated with these public spaces that we all use. We don't really care about that much. We don't really think about that. And so, as we talk about mobility, as we talk about innovation, we always talk about cars. Eh? Tesla, BMW, Toyota, cars. But what about highways? And what about bicycle paths and pedestrian paths? And are they not part of design thinking? And so we were asked by the famous Van Gogh Foundation, the famous Dutch painter, to celebrate his 125th anniversary. And so what I started to do is I started to follow his footsteps and I found this beautiful bicycle path in a dark area, in a nature area, uh, in the Netherlands, in Eindhoven. And so we made a path that charges at daytime by the sun, phosphorant material, and it glows at night. Uh, and you're sort of cycling through his famous starry night. History, he walked there. Future, eh, green energy, something poetry, something practical, and uh, it's still there. You can go there every night for free, no ticket needed. Um, it just shows that our infrastructure is a sort of an interface that we're not using yet, and uh, it became very popular. So many people come there to, to book a hotel room or a restaurant or stuff like that. So I think public art is a really great activator to make people feel connected with their environment, with the local stories, with the history, but also the future. And uh, yeah, although it was only seven or 800 meters, not super big, it really, I think, changed the mindset of, of what's possible. So that's cool. It seems that for you, nothing is impossible. Is this a driving force behind your work? Yeah, when you go to college uh, for art history, and we're in it with the Waterlicht. So if you, if, you did, if you graduated fine art, you get like three questions about our, our flood. Like, uh, what is the artist trying to say with this artwork? Or uh, what do you think is the idea behind? And, uh, and, and so suddenly we pop up in education, right? And, and it's interesting because I've always had people telling me what you want is not possible, right? Not possible, not possible. 
And but now, sometimes I'm being shown as an example that it is possible. And so I hope that I inspire people, but also the amount of people saying it's not possible is a little bit reduced. <laughs> Just a little bit, not too much, eh? but a little bit. And, and so it's really cool to sort of see it pop up in education, in children books, and uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it's not so much about me and the work, but it's about showing what is possible. And I think that mentality is also needed to face the, the challenges we, we are already facing, right? Um, there's, you know, people are scared of the future or ignorant or they just try to ignore or, uh, but that's a problem because if we cannot imagine that better future, we can also not create it, right? So we got to talk about, we got to think, we got to dream, we got to prototype, we got to engineer, we're going to fail, we're going to learn from it and try again. And, 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 and I think that mentality is, is, is needed to be future-proof. So I hope the projects that we do and the, the, the thinking that we do uh, activate people to, to become part of that. Let's see, you know, let's see how that goes. Yeah. Let's say that one of the projects uh, which are redefining what is possible, what is impossible, is certainly your Gates of Light project. Uh, what is this uh, project about? So the Gates of Light is situated in the middle of a nature area, so lightning is not allowed. Um, and we were asked to highlight the iconic value. These are famous floodgates, right? so they defend, they protect the Netherlands from, from drowning. Historical monuments. Um, normally it's not touch, yeah? you can't touch them. And, but somehow we got the permission to renovate them and also to, to highlight, to upgrade them. So what we did is we covered them with retroreflective prismas. Um, the same you know from the safety jacket eh, or the traffic signs. So based on the headlights of the car that drive by, they illuminate. Um, so you have light, energy neutral, and when there's no car, there's no light, so there's no light pollution, right? So it's sort of a material extremely developed uh, to create yeah, smart lightning, but, but in a simple way. And this, this is Gates of Light, it's a permanent in the Netherlands as well. And it just shows that, you just show light when it's there, when it's needed, and don't have it when it's not necessary. Um, you also get back the stars, which is sort of cool, right? You get back the stars, which we sort of lost because of the way we treat cities and we treat light pollution and, tr and, and street lights in the last 25 years. So it's all about trying to find a new harmony between people and nature and using design to, to, to create that harmony. That's it. When you talk about your work, uh, you stress that you use beauty as a strategy. What kind of strategy is that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. So a lot of times when we talk about the future, we talk about money, economy, uh, technology, uh, fear, but we're not showing the beauty of a better future in order to help people to accept change. Beauty is a very powerful strategy, right? You, you see something, you don't really understand it, but you want to be a part of it. And, and so what we're actually showing is, look, you can have organic fireworks without polluting uh, skies. Or look, you can have clean air parks. Or look, you, we can bring the stars back. Um, and, and beauty activates people. And it helps them to go over the hurdles we all feel when we want to change. Because people don't really like change, right? They're like, Ugh, like we want to be comfortable, right? We don't like change. So beauty helps people to accept change and to accelerate change. And I think we should do that more. We should learn more from that. Yeah. So you use beauty as a strategy and a wonder as a resource. Uh, we all experience wonders in our lives, but uh, they're mostly short-lived. Uh, in your view, uh, how can we make wonders more sustainable? Mm, well, that's a good question. Yeah, you're right, okay, because sometimes it's an experience, a moment, a collective experience you do together, like looking at the stars or, or, or looking at organic fireworks. But you're right, in the end, it should be integrated into our daily lives, right? In a way, it's like fashion, you know, you have your haute couture, Paris catwalk dress, it's a beautiful big statement, but the knowledge that you build up from making that dress ends up in, the, you know, in, in your five euro t-shirt, right? In your pret-a-porter. So innovation always starts like that. Big idea, complicated, smart people, eh, larger budgets, but the knowledge you build up from that ends up in day-to-day in -day society. So I think, you know, in the end, you'll have an organic firework um, set for, 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 for local consumer, right? or in the end you have lightning which is not harmful to nature. But you first got to show the big statement and then you know, it will influence the rest. That, that's how change happens. Yeah. You are frequently asked 
uh, how are you getting all these creative ideas? Um, I'm interested to know uh, how this process of creation is evolving. Making ideas happen is horrible. I mean, it's, it's, it's a horrible process, you know, it's super uncomfortable. It's like this itch that you cannot scratch. So you're always sort of, like an, like an idea is like a prisoner. It just wants to escape. It just wants to escape out of your head. And somehow it tries to find a way to escape. And the moment it gets out of your head, it gets gravity. Bam! It starts to get real, right? So a good idea, um, you surrender to a good idea, right? You don't own the idea but you feed it with your love, time, money, and energy, and it takes you to a place you, you've never been before. And, and in the beginning, there are always people who are saying, not possible, not allowed. <laughs> but once it's finally becoming a reality, people say, oh, you should have done it before, or why is it not everywhere? So, so the whole process of going from an idea to reality is, is, is fragile and you need to fight for it and you need to work on it. But the other hand, it's, it's the coolest thing in the world, right? <laughs> I think. Because it changes your perception of what is normal and not normal. And, and I think that, that's the true power of, of an idea. It helps people to change yeah, and, and brings you to a new place. Yeah. But you've got to make it happen. You've got to make it real. Yeah. In this process of creation, it is important not to be focused on the obstacles. Uh, this is probably why uh, you designed a yes but chair in your uh, studio. Uh, what is this uh, chair about? Well, I mean, people are very creative in find, finding re reasons to not change. They're very good at that, right? Like, that's, that's, that's the easy part. Um, and we're like, what, what if we move from the yes but, eh? yes but, it's too expensive, too cheap, to the what now? And so we designed the yes but chair, which is little voice recognition element hindered underneath it. And so the moment you sit on that chair, which looks like a normal chair, and you say those two horrible yes but words, it recognizes it and gives you a little shock on your uh, bottom. And it's not just a joke, it's also a mentality. So everybody who goes to the studio knows this story. It actually is there, that chair. And it's sort of reprogramming people. Like, why am I saying yes but all the time? And how can I move to the what now, and, or the what if, or what's next? So it's really about trying to help people to open up. Uh, uh, so, so although it's funny, uh, it's also real, and we're very serious about it at the same time. Yeah, so let's move from the yes but to the, to the what now, or what's next. Yeah. This mindset uh, seems to be a good foundation uh, for uh, creativity. In your view, how can education cultivate creativity? Education is horrible. Like, like I was kicked out of fire not school twice. You know, 80% of the stuff I'm doing now, I was never educated for. So that's, a, you know, I'll manage, but it's a problem for a bigger audience and a bigger generation. Like, why are we learning all these facts? You know, when Napoleon conquered war, like, who can, we have robots for that. We should train creativity, emotional intelligence, empathy, learning how to work in groups, how, learning how to work with, with different types of people who think in a different way and that diversity is sort of good instead of a threat. Uh, self-care, self-love. Dude, I'm 42 years old. I'm beginning to learn that now. I wish I would have known that 20 years ago, you know? That would have saved me so much time. So, so, so we have to learn and realize that creativity is our true capital, right? And so education needs to be focused on that, not just on the numbers or the facts. Like, the, the, the robots can help with that. Um, and, and that's a change that you see is, is in progress now, step by step, yeah. And, uh, and the kids, especially between eight and 12, are super receptive for that. They, 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 they get it, and you can see it in their eyes. So we need to keep that, yeah, no, don't kill it. Yeah. It's already there, yeah, 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 yeah. But we're just used to put people in boxes and in frames and in linear processes. And then, then you kill it. And, and you can bring that back by introducing wonder. Like being in those cities, switching off the lights and seeing the stars, it does bring back you to your childhood feeling. Um, so it's still there, it's just hidden. But that's okay, we can, we can bring that back, it's okay. How come you were kicked out of school twice? Well, they tried to fit me in a box and I didn't want to. So like, yeah, and if you tell me what to do, that usually doesn't work so like <laughs> yeah and maybe I was also too young to you know like you have all these ideas but you don't know how now I can be more adult about it and talk and be reasonable and rational 
but when you're younger you just you have all these emotions that you want to express and you don't know how you know like so it's also very confusing right and then if you have a system which just tries to ram you into the urgent like, bye so you resist um, but of course in the end nobody really benefits from that right the school doesn't I don't the students we nobody learned anything so so yeah you should create environments um, which are a little bit more open to diversity and, and for people who want to do things in a different way instead of pushing them in all the same pattern. Yeah. Is this how you work with your creative team? Uh, how do you hire people? What are you after? So, so I think it's really important to have people who are really good in materials or technology and do research, but you also need people who are really good in, in operational management skills, yeah? uh, guiding the teams or, or, for example, the public space exhibitions we're doing are complicated, you know, thousands of people, it's public space, it's new technology, uh, we have to check for safety. So I'm just trying to create teams who are, are in that, from idea to, to real, are, are experts eh, in certain phases. Um, and I need to hire some people who, who understand the big dream, the artistic dream, and to make sure that everything is going the right way. So basically what you're doing is this. On one end you're defining, fighting for details, controlling. On the other end you're opening up and saying, oh, but are we still on the right track? Is it still the right feeling? So you're, you're having this little dance 20,000 times per day. And so you need different people in different modes. But basically you want to work with the best. You know, people who are smarter than you in a, in a certain way. And that's sort of fun, right? And, um, we have a very strict no asshole policy, so we, we don't work with assholes. I can say asshole, right? Yeah, sure. Um, and, um, but a lot of it is, is, is that they're being challenged uh, by the idea or by me or by society to, to make something happen which is impossible. And that should be a trigger, not a worrying thing. But it's quite rare. Yeah, not easy to find. You need to train them. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. But, 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 but give people a challenge and that's a good way to activate them, the, the good ones, yeah. yeah. The bad ones just run away and want to hide and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. be lazy. Yeah, okay, that's fine, but not, not in my studio. Yeah. You are getting many requests from all over the world. Uh, how are you choosing the right ones for you? It's insane. Like, we're getting so many requests from, you know, people from India or China. Like, it's all over the world, and sometimes it's more like we want Spark or Van Gogh, like like very specific project that we've done before. Sometimes it's something completely new, uh, like a new theme or a new place or a new, a new experience. Mm, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to find also things that interest me, right? So I'm really interested in creating these sort of collective experiences, these dreamscapes, where, where you just come. It's sort of like a, like a movie set, and you're the Brad Pitt, there's no beginning and end, and you open up together, wonder, eh? like Waterlicht or Spark. Uh, so I'm really fascinated in, in creating these public experiences where, where you are willing to change your mind eh? and change your perception. So, so I'm saying yes to a lot of projects who embrace that. So that can be a museum or a city or a mayor or a city developer um, or, or a cultural institution or a conference like this. Uh, but yeah, you, you have to say no many times to get a good yes. Yeah, you can't do everything. Yeah. In your talk today you mentioned that we are facing the time of uh, limitations and scarcity. How can this challenge be dealt with? We've been promised a, a time of abundance, endless energy, endless food, endless travel, but now we're hitting scarcity, right? So we're running out of resources and energy is getting more expensive. We cannot travel anymore. And like, so, so, and these groups of people are sort of traveling towards us and we call them immigrants. They're like, we're not sure what to do with it. So, you know, this is definitely the time of boundaries and scarcity. So, but we gotta, we gotta, we gotta deal with that. And, and maybe it's a resource or maybe we can learn something from that or maybe we have to, I love the Seeing Star project in that way because it's like switching off the lights, saving energy, removing light pollution, and you, what are we getting back? The stars, right? So it shows the beauty of scarcity, of doing less. And I think that mentality could be sort of quite useful in the coming 10, 20 years. Uh, because there's more, 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 it's just not going to cut. And people will also not accept it. So you can have your little yacht boat here in Montenegro, but a lot of people are not happy with it and they will come and take it away from you sooner or later. I mean, 
sooner or later. So yeah, yeah, find new harmony, show the beauty of doing less, and, and change your value system in that way. Yeah. Today on this uh, stage you talked about connection between empathy and innovation. Not very ordinary uh, combination, so I would like to know what is the essence of this connection in your view? It's about feeling connected with yourself, with each other, with the world around you. And the, mo the stronger you have that connection, the more you can achieve. So instead of me damaging you to profit, I remember that if I'm damaging you in the long run, it's going to hurt me as well, right? Because it's all planet Earth. It's the same system we're in. And so if there's win-win, as the Chinese would say, win-win, that's the long-term game. Very easy to say, very difficult to execute. But uh, Steve Jobs said that once, like he invested a lot in his people, in his, his staff, like training and courses and food. And then his manager was like, okay, but we're investing in all in these people. And what if they leave? We've invested all this stuff and, and then they're gone. And then he said something really smart that changed my life. He said, sure, that can happen, right? We can invest and then they can leave. But what if we don't invest in them and they stay? <laughs> you know, like what if we don't invest in our stuff and they stay and they don't develop and they don't evolve? That's even worse. And I thought that was so generous and so smart. And uh, yeah, there's some beauty in, 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 that, in, in that story. Yeah. You really sparked the audience uh, today here at the uh, Spark Me conference. At the end uh, of this interview, uh, I would like to know what sparks you, what sparks your life. I love the idea that, that you know, when you have an idea, it takes you somewhere. It takes you to a place you've never been before, you know, so it's like, and then you already know like, oh boy, you know, this is going to be another two years of my life. <laughs> it's going to take all my energy, my time, my love, my frustration, but it will bring me to a new place that I cannot imagine yet, right? I cannot imagine I'm switching off city lights in collaboration with the mayors to bring back the stars two years ago, but I'm doing it now. And so in the same way, we cannot imagine where we'll be in a hundred years or in a thousand years. We can't, we just can't. And so the only thing we can do is, is believe in our dreams, believe in our sparks and, and, and cherish them and educate them and, 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 and love them. Um, so I love that process in which I'm making things, but the making also makes me. And, and in the meantime, have some fun, you know, like, like also the notion of, of the joy of, of making things happen is, is really important. Yeah. So. Let's see where it takes us. One night, I realized that there's this amazing light performance above us, but we don't see it. Over 80% of the world population is disconnected from our universe because of light pollution. To bring back the stars, I ask an entire city to switch off all their lights. UNESCO aims to recognize seeing stars as our universal heritage. Seeing stars is one switch away.